come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In Shakespeare's play, Hamlet asks the question, to be or not to be? For hundreds of years, thinking men have tried to define precisely what we mean by those words, to be or not to be. Because there are times when the line between being and not being, the distinction between what some of us call life and death, is such a thin line that it is difficult to say whether at some particular point a human being actually is or is not. Our mystery drama, One of the Missing, was especially adapted from the Ambrose Bierce classic for the Mystery Theater by Stella and Arnold Moss. It stars Christopher Tabori. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It's an insufferably hot day near the end of June. The year is 1864. The place, northern Georgia, in the shadow of an 1,800-foot elevation called Kennesaw Mountain. The Confederate Army has stopped here in retreat from the advancing troops of the Union General, William Tecumseh Sherman. In his tent, a Union captain speaks. Private Searing? Sir. And you are Private Daniel Ransom? Yes, sir, I am. You know our position, Searing? Well, I'm not sure, sir. But there's been talk in the ranks that we're getting close to Atlanta. Not more than 20 miles. Yes, sir. You both know what the fall of Atlanta will mean to us. Ransom? I think I do, sir. It could mean the end of the war. We've been ordered to advance upon the enemy, leave him no quarter, no time to rest or to reassemble his troops. General McPherson is a cautious man. We know that, sir. He's not content to obey an order blindly without knowing exactly and specifically what's in front of him. He wants the most complete, the most detailed intelligence possible, and I've been ordered to get it. That's where you two soldiers come in. Yes, sir. We believe the enemy to be in a strong position. You are to pass our own picket lines, travel through the forest, and get as near to the enemy's lines as you possibly can. And learn all that we can. Is that correct, sir? Exactly, Searing. Oh, uh, one last word. The outcome of this long, bloody war may well depend on our success or failure in taking Atlanta. We understand that, sir. When do we start? Immediately. If you accomplish this mission this day, the 30th day of June, 1864, may well go down as one of the most important dates in the history of our country. Good luck to you both. In no time at all, Ransom and I were creeping stealthily forward on our hands and knees past our own men in blue on picket duty lying in groups of two and four behind little banks of red earth. Dan, it's got so quiet and peaceful. All of a sudden, Jerry. How do you explain it? Got no idea. How much further do you figure we have to go? Uh, no way of telling yet. Why? I don't know. Maybe I'm a little afraid. Don't think I'm quite ready to die. Not just yet. Oh, now, you've never been afraid of anything in your whole life. Any more than I have. Hey, but this is different. Why is it all so quiet? Just keep your eyes and ears open. Look for everything. Listen for everything. And take your time. Yeah. It's slow going. Oh, we'll get there. Hey! Wait a minute. Flatten yourself down. Blow as you can get. And don't move. What is it? What do you see? What do you hear? Take a look through that narrow opening in the bushes. And you tell me. Tell me what you see, Dan. A little mound of yellow clay. Not more than ten feet from here. You know what it is, don't you? Of course. It's one of their rifle pits. One of the men. Be, be careful, Jerry. Don't worry. Jerry, what are you doing? Look over there, Dad. Two boys in gray, sitting with their backs, leaning against that sycamore tree. What do we do? We'll capture them, Dan. You and I capture them. They're fast asleep. Oh, the captain never counted on this. Information from two prisoners of war. You cover the one on the left. I'll cover the other one. All right. Oh, Johnny Reb. The war's going to be over for you. On your feet. Hands over your head. They don't hear you. Get up off your bottoms before I... What? What is it? They're not asleep, Dan. They're dead. Huh. Come on, let's get moving. Hey, 
You'll get your head blown off. Keep down. There may be some live ones about. Are you coming? Stan. Hey, Stan, look at this rifle pit. Nobody. There's been nobody in this pit for the last couple of hours. But same's true for that pit over here. And this one. No, no, Dan. It's just the two of us. Where where do you suppose they've gone? I, I'm not sure. But I'll tell you one thing. We're damn well going to find out. We pushed across the line of abandoned rifle pits, running from one cover to another in the open forest, looking into every conceivable hiding place to discover any possible stragglers. Not a soul. The enemy was gone. After a while, we came to the edge of a plantation. One of those uh, forlorn, deserted homesteads, upgrown by now with brambles, ugly broken fences, and desolate with blank openings, where there once were doors and windows. Hey, watch your step, Dan. You can't tell what might be in there. Could be a trap. No, I don't think so. We're not going to take any chances. How long do you figure we've been out? Well, not as long as it feels. We can't have come too far. We're still alive. Dan, look over there. A little building? What is it? Oh, what was it? Looks like a single room sitting on top of four high posts. Yeah, about ten feet off of the ground. What do you say we take a look? Be a fine place to get a good peek at the country from all angles. And maybe find out the direction they took when they withdrew. Keep your rifle steady. Just in case. Hey, this little shack has certainly taken a beating. It's hardly more than a roof on spilt. Yeah, most of the flooring has fallen away. The joists, the planks, just rotten away. Looks as like if the whole thing would go down at the touch of a finger. Uh, if we move slowly, I think we can get to the top there without anything happening. I think it will bear our weight. Uh, careful now, Jerry. Here we go. Give me a hand, Dan. There we are. You all right? Fine. Here, here, take my field glasses. That's quite a view from up. No. Dan, will you take a look at that? Where? That way. They can't be more than half a mile away. There must be thousands of them on that narrow road. It's their rear guard covering their retreat. See how their gun barrels gleam in the morning sunlight? They're heading south, towards that river. That could be the next stand. Well, we'd better get back to our command as fast as we can and report what we found. Oh, wait a minute. I was just thinking. That's a temptation. A real big temptation. What are you talking about? Ah, you remember Missionary Ridge? I wasn't there. The Confederate lines were extended all the way from the ridge, straight across the whole Chattanooga Valley, all the way to Lookout Mountain. Just the way they are down there. Jerry, we've got to get back. Long, great columns of Confederates slogging down the other side of that mountain road, almost exactly the way they're toiling up this one. And there was this heavy gun of theirs. On top of the mountain? It had been throwing charge after charge of grape at us. When we got to it, the cannon was still hot. Ammunition right behind us. Jerry, that's all very well, but... I looked into that round, brazen ring of its muzzle, and I knew what I had to do. One last parting shot at them. A peck of iron from their own gun as they swarmed down the mountainside like so many ants. And did you? Just as I'm about to do right now. Oh, you should have seen them scatter. Doesn't the sight of those ribs tempt you, Danny? To do what? All I have to do is take this beautiful Springfield rifle of mine, put it to my shoulder like this. Harry, where are you going? With this old globe sight and this hair trigger, all I have to do is take careful aim, press the trigger ever so gently. Ever so gently. Harry, put that down. You'll have the whole enemy army down on the two of us. Easiest thing in the world to send an ounce and a quarter of lead hissing right through into them. Are you out of your mind, Jerry? Put that gun down. It's the business of a soldier to kill. Not now, Jerry. We've got to get back. It also becomes a soldier's habit to kill. What is the matter with you, Jerry? Just one little shot. Jerry, you have gone crazy. One little shot. Jerry, put down that gun. I won't miss. I just draw back the hammer like this. Jerry, don't do it. I set the trigger. Aim into the sight carefully like this. And I bring my finger... Ever so slowly to the hair trigger, and... I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. What's happened? I can't open my eyes. Whose voice is that? Sounds like my commanding officer. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer lives. Those are the words of the burial service. Who are they burying? I know his body be destroyed, yet shall I see God. That huge explosion. 
That's it. An enemy shell must have hit the frame of the shed Ransom and I were standing on, just as I was about to pull the trigger of my rifle. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. May the Lord receive the soul of Jerome Searing. They're burying me. Amen. No. It can't be. No. It must not be. Someone once called life a means to an end. An end that sooner or later catches up with all of us. Someone else compared life to a cup of tea. The more deeply we drink of it, the more quickly we reach the dregs. For Private Jerome Searing, the question has become, is the cup still full? Is he still alive? Or by an accident of fate, has he been forced to drain the cup to the very bottom. I shall return shortly with Act Two. When that day comes, as it must to all men, when we have drawn our last breath, will there be some signal, some way of knowing that the end indeed has come? Or do we, as Jerome Searing may be doing, settle for the idea that our whole life is a kind of dream within a dream, from which we are awakened by death itself. I finally managed to open my eyes. I saw a patch of gray sky rising from a fringe on top of the trees. In the foreground, there was a crazy crisscross pattern of heavy black straight lines that blacked out part of the sky. I felt drained, exhausted. Once more, I shut my eyes. I heard what seemed to be the rhythmic breaking of waves upon a beach. Over it, I could hear a familiar voice, repeating over and over again. Jerome Searing. Jerome Searing. You are caught. Caught. Like a rat in a trap. A rat in a trap. A rat in a trap. And then I heard something else. What's that? Who is that? Who is it? Walking there above my head. It's me, Jerry. Marion. Your wife, Jerry. Why are you here? I came to mourn at your grave. My grave? To add my weight and the weight of our child to the weight of the earth upon your breast. Why are you saying these things, Marion? Why did you throw your life away? I've done no such thing. The brave private Jerome Searing. Young, handsome, intelligent. A good father. A good husband. Those are the things you were, Jerry. Now you're a hero. A dead hero. I don't believe you. You don't want to believe me. Open your eyes. Why? If you can, Jerry. What do you see? Nothing. Everything's become black. And outside of your voice up there, I hear nothing. Then admit it, Jerry. Admit what? The simple fact that you are dead. That you are buried. That I am up here, your widow. Kneeling now in sorrow on your grave. I tried to open my eyes a second time. I took a deep breath, but breathing was difficult. Everything about me was so still. And then it all came back. The shack. The retreating enemy troops. My sighting the rifle. The explosion of the Confederate artillery. And I remembered Danny. Dan? Danny! Where are you, Danny? Where are you? Are you here? Jerry? Are you all right? I can't see you, Dan. Where are you? I can see you. Just about. I'm over here, and I'm more than ten feet from you. I hear your voice. My eyes are open, but I can't see you. I can't move. Can you, Danny? I don't know. Very little. Maybe just enough to... What's wrong, Jerry? I'm lying here flat on my back. But 
on an angle. My head's a little higher than my feet. My back is supported by some kind of solid wooden beam. You can't move at all. Not an inch. There's another tremendous piece of timber lying right on my chest. Much too heavy to move. And there's a kind of brace that joins at right angles that has me wedged against a pile of boards on my left. Can't move my left arm at all. How about your legs? They're straight out, I think. I have no feeling in them. My head feels as if it were being held in some kind of tight vice. I can move my eyes and my chin. But that's all. How about you, Dan? Not quite that bad, I guess. Even if I could move this, whole mess might come down on us and make things worse than they are. The slightest move. Yeah, you may be right, Dan. But if we don't take that chance, we could be here forever. And nobody would ever know. Dan, I can move the fingers of my right hand. Anything else? No, nothing else. I'm going to try to move, Jerry. I've got a little support here at my back. I may be able to loosen my right leg. Be careful, Dan. I might just be able to push myself. Oh, watch it, Danny. Oh, there. I got my hand free. Oh, gee, I'm sorry, Jerry. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. You? Well, the dirt and the rubble are up to my chin now. Well, one thing is for sure. We can't just lie here like a couple of corpses. We've got to get out and report to headquarters. What'd you just say, Dan? Don't be expecting us. Headquarters will be waiting no, 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 for us. No, no, no. No, before that. You said we... We can't just lie here like a couple of corpses. Well, can we? Answer me, Jerry. Can we? As I tried to find an answer to Danny's question, once more I heard the voice of my wife, Marion. We were both standing at the mouth of Dead Man's Cave. It seemed like a thousand years ago. Ah! Oh, we finally made it, Jerry. Dead Man's oh. Cave. What a climb. I was sure once we made it past Ghost Rock, the rest would be easy. Now, as soon as we oh. catch our breath, we'll have a look inside. And we're going to find out why they say it's haunted. Oh. Let's rest a little first. Oh, Jerry, darling. You know there's going to be a war. It looks that way. Promise me one thing. If I can. Wait until your time comes. Don't volunteer. Let's have as much time together as we can before you feel you have to go. I can't promise that. Why not? Oh, please, Jerry. Because I've already volunteered. Yesterday. Oh, Jerry, you don't have the remotest idea of the meaning of the word fear, do you? Jerry! Those shots are coming from inside Dead Man's Cave. Who's in there? Whoever you are, come out of there. I'm going in to see. Wait, Jerry. Look up at the mouth of the cave. What is that? A huge ring of black metal is forming a circle around the entrance. Let's get out of here. It's like looking into the muzzle of a giant rifle. Who are you in there? Answer me. You answer me. Private Jerome Searing, you are caught, caught, like a rat in a trap. Like a rat in a trap, 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 trap. At that point, I found myself staring into two beady, red little eyes. They came closer and closer. They became larger and larger. I was staring into the eyes of an oversized rat that must have lived in the shed where we were standing on before it collapsed. Get away. You've no business here. The creature scampered away. We're alive, all right. Why we should be, I hardly know. After practically the whole world fell down on us. We're alive, no question about it. What makes you so sure? Well, you hear me, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. The dead have no voices, Jerry. I'm alive, and you're alive. And we've got to find some way to get out of here. Are you in pain? There may be something wrong with my right hand. There's a sharp, smart pain there. Okay, can you move your fingers? Try to work them. They feel wet and slippery. I can't see the hand, but I know the sensation. It's running blood. I must have ripped it on a piece of metal where the shed collapsed. How long do you think we've been in here, Dan? I haven't any idea. Seconds? 
minutes, possibly hours. Well, it couldn't have been too long. The dust is still settling. There's still dust in the air. The way I'm held by these beams, uh, I can't see. Whatever we're going to do, Jerry, we'd better get some rest first. We'll need every ounce of strength we've got. That's a good idea, Dan. Some of our boys are sure to stray out here. Either foraging or maybe even looking for us. Yes, yes, of course. And they'll find us, too. Somebody will surely find us. Private Searing, I'm glad I found you. Yes, sir. What took you so long? Well, sir, just as we were about to return to headquarters... Yes? There was this explosion. Everything collapsed, sir. And that's the sum total of your intelligence report? No, sir. The enemy has started to retreat. They're moving southeast toward the river. There must be at least 2,000 of them. I should judge they began their retreat about two hours ago. Fine work, Searing. Excellent. I'll see that you're properly rewarded. Your country will be very proud of you. Yes, thank you, sir. And now, would it be possible to get us out of here? We can't stay here like this forever. You won't have to, Searing. Thank you, sir. Sooner or later, you'll be taken out. Sooner or later? There's nothing we can do at this moment, Private. Too many other things to do. Priorities. You mean you're going to let me stay here? As good as dead. 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 As good as dead. Jerry, wake up. Wake up. What's wrong? Uh, I must have been dreaming. How long was I asleep? I no idea. I, I dozed off a bit, too. Oh, if I could only get this right hand free. Then I could try to get this piece of timber off my chest. Oh, but there's not a chance. Jerry, I think some of this junk has moved. It begins to look as though I might have the faintest chance of getting some of this stuff off of me. Can you move at all, Jerry? No, not as much as a hair. Except for the fingers of my right hand. Dan? Yeah? It's the strangest thing. I couldn't see it before, but now that the sun has risen, everything's a whole lot clearer. What are you talking about? There's something inches away from my forehead. Pointed right at it. What kind of thing? I'm not sure. It's something like a ring of black shining metal. Right in front of my eyes. How big can you see? It's so close, it's hard to tell. I think I know what it is, Danny. It's my rifle. What? It's the muzzle of my rifle. The barrel's being held in place by the debris and rubbish. The gun is still cocked, just as it was when I was about to fire it. The slightest movement... The slightest touch on the trigger will set it off. And it's aimed at the exact center of my forehead. Do you remember the story of the ancient Greek Damocles, who was invited to a sumptuous banquet? As he dined, without a care in the world, he happened to look up above his head to discover a sharp-edged sword dangling by a single hair directly over his head. His host had placed it there to impress Damocles with the dangerous nature of life itself. Private Jerome Searing finds that his life is hanging by the same sort of fragile thread. The outcome? I'll return shortly with Act Three. Ambrose Bierce, the author of One of the Missing cynically defined man as an animal so lost in contemplation of what he thinks he is that he tends to overlook what he really ought to be. And among man's chief occupations, he added, is the extermination of other animals, his own species included. With his loaded rifle pointed at his head, unable to move and having lost all sense of the passing of time, Private Jerome Searing's chief occupation is to find some way of preventing his accidental extermination by his own hand. Jerry? Jerry, are you awake? Yeah, I'm awake. Are you all right? The barrel of my rifle seems to be closer to my head than it was before. I can't breathe for fear of setting it off. I'm afraid to move. How's your hand? It's still losing blood. It's begun to throb, up a slow, regular pulsation. Each one sharper than the one before. Now that we've rested a bit, we'll figure something out. Dan. What is it? That rat. That was here before. It's come back again. 
It won't harm you, watch you. It's slowly making its way up the wooden stock of the rifle. Its eyes are looking straight into mine as it moves forward. Now it's sniffing around the hair trigger. Dad, what do I do? Just keep still. Don't move. If its nose or tail so much as touches the trigger. I'm not afraid to die, Dan. But not this way. Not like this. He was not afraid to live dangerously. He was not afraid to die. What was I hearing? Where was that voice coming from? Private Jerome Searing, cut off from his fellows by an accident of destiny, did not fear to yield to the ultimate act of courage that brought him to his fatal end. Those words made no sense. I was not dead. Yet, I was still very much alive. And all the time, I listened to the drone of that voice. I kept my eyes glued onto that loathsome little animal that was sniffing its slow way up along the rifle stock. A flick of its tail, and I'd be gone. Then suddenly it stopped, turned around, scampered off. With the free fingers of my torn and bleeding hand, moving nothing else but my eyes, I groped for whatever might be in reach. Dan! Dan, something's happened. What is it? My fingers have touched a strip of board, a building lap of some kind. I can just barely touch it. Where is it, Jerry? Right alongside my body. I can just bend my elbow as much as an inch. I think I might be able to get hold of it with the tips of my fingers. Well, if you can do that. Then I might be able to work it upward. That, that's to say backward, toward me. Far enough to lift the end of it and try to push the rifle away from my head. Try, Jerry. You've got to try. If the worst happens, and I can't push the gun away, if it's wedged too tightly into the ground, I can always try to touch the strip of board to the trigger itself. What kind of solution is that? It may be the only one that's left, Danny. <laughs> fingers reached out for the length of wood. Slowly, the real world began to come into focus once again. Here in this confusion of timber and boards, this was the sole universe. The only thing that was. Here was immortality in time. Forever and ever. Jerry, something's happened over here. What? If I'm very careful, I think I may be able to loosen some more of this stuff around me. I'm going to push... Down with my hands, very gently, against the ground, and come out backwards. I hope. A stone, a pebble, a clump of earth dropped against this trigger would be the end of me. And maybe of both of us. I know that, Jerry. I'll be as careful as I can. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If by some miracle you can get out of this mess without sending a bullet through the middle of my head, you leave me here, just as I am, while you hurry back to headquarters, is that it? I didn't say that. Not in so many words. Then you delivered to the captain the intelligence report of the enemy movements that you observed, that you discovered, and you, Private Ransom, great hero that you are, are promoted in the field and become Lieutenant Ransom. Is that it, Danny? I don't know what you're talking about. Meantime, poor unfortunate Private Searing lies buried under this pile of garbage with the inside of his head scattered all over the place. Too bad. Just one of the missing... If any of what you're saying were true, Jerry... Just exactly what could you do to prevent it? At the moment, not a blessed thing. I suppose if this rifle of mine should go off while you're getting out of here, you might call it an accident of fate, wouldn't you? What would you call it, Private Searing? I would call it plain and simple murder. For a moment in time, there was nothing. I must have blacked out. Soon I found myself trembling in every fiber of my body, drenched in my own sweat. Dan? Danny? There was no answer. Of course. Danny had managed to escape. Well, hadn't he? And a terrifying thought gripped my mind. Who was I calling? Danny? Danny Ransom? In a flash of clarity, it came to me. I had never in my life even known a Danny Ransom. How could he answer me? There is no Danny. There never was a Danny. Danny was a creation of my own fevered imagination. From the very beginning, I was sent out on this mission alone. Detail, halt! Men, we 
We've now spent two whole days in search of Private Searing. We've not been able to find a single trace of him. I'm here, Captain. Right here. Practically under your nose. Having done everything within our power to find him or his body with no success, I feel that we would be justified in calling off the search. You can't do that. I'll die if you leave me. And you're so close. We'll return to quarters. Howard! Dan! Danny! No. I'd forgotten. There's no Danny. But if he had never existed, at least Marion did. My wife was no invention. If I could only be with her, this whole nightmare would go away. Who are you? Marion, it's me, Jerry. I've come home from the war. You've changed so. I didn't recognize you. Is the war ended? For me, it is. Why have you come here? This is my home. You're my wife. Why have you come? Take me back, Marion. Let me come home. I cannot. Too many things have changed. You'll have to excuse me now. It's begun to rain. Don't leave me. I have so many things to do. Please don't try to stop me. I'm due somewhere. Somewhere very important. Where do you have to go? This bouquet of flowers. Very important. Goodbye, Jerome. I'm going to go with you, wherever it is. If you like, Jerome. If you like. Where are we, Marion? Don't you recognize the place? It's the old burial ground, next to the church. Would you like to stand under my umbrella? The rain is coming down harder. No, no, I'm fine the way I am. In recognition of his devotion to his country, above and beyond the call of duty. What's he doing here? He's no reason to... Be quiet, Jerome. The captain is speaking. It is my honor and privilege on this solemn occasion to bestow upon his widow, Marion, his country's acknowledgement of its gratitude in the form of this medal of honor awarded posthumously. Mr. Searing, will you kindly step forward? Stop, Marion. Stop what you're doing. All of you. There's been a mistake. A huge mistake. I was alone again, buried in the rubble. Alone, except maybe for the rats. The fingers of my torn hand reach out to the strip of wood I had discovered. But somewhere the piece of wood met some kind of an obstruction. I was not able to touch the trigger. The black mouth of that rifle is still growing sharper and sharper. I can already feel the track of the bullet burning its way into my head. Six o'clock? Morning? Evening? What difference does it make? Oh, come on, hand, do something. Get that stick to touch off the trigger of the rifle. Good, hand, good. Now touch the trigger. Stick. Touch it. Trigger off, but there's been no shot. No! 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 Sergeant? Sir? The squad ready? Yes, Captain. Uh, this will be our final attempt to locate Private Searing. Alive, if he's still alive, or dead. I understand, sir. Let me see now. It's exactly one minute past 6 a.m. Uh, note that, won't you, for the report? And the date is... Uh, 6th of July, Captain. 6th of July. I sent him out on the 30th. He's been gone a week. Well, the chances of finding him alive... Now, what was that? L uh, look through your field glasses, Sergeant. Over in that direction. Now, what do you see? Our old shack we've had under observation. The dust is still rising. Must have just collapsed. That was the noise we heard. We have no shots. No explosion of any kind. Seems to have fallen by itself. It's a complete wreck. That's interesting. Well, while we're looking for Searing, we might take a quick look at it. Sergeant. Sergeant, will you come here, please? Look there. Is that him? I almost didn't recognize him. He's so covered with dust. 
I've seen a good many dead men. None ever with a face of that color. Oh, cheeks are falling in, the temples are sunk. Look at the mouth, the upper lip pulled back, showing his clenched teeth. Here, give me a hand here. Let's try to get him out. Here we go. Yeah. yeah, that was easier than I thought it would be. The body outside of the right hand seems to be in excellent shape. No bones appear to be broken. Help me turn him over. Yeah. Yeah. Not a sign of any kind of a gun wound any place on the body. Do you see any? No, sir, none at all. Well, there's his rifle. May I have it, please? Uh, thank you. That's strange. What's that, Captain? There's no shell in the chamber of the rifle. Not even a spent one. Searing's gun was not loaded. That's peculiar. Very strange. Such a good soldier. What would you suppose was the cause of death? It's hard to say. Maybe simple starvation or thirst or a combination of both. After all, he's been dead a week. What time do you have, Sergeant? 6.18, sir. Remember that for the report. Yes, sir. And have your men carry the body back to camp. We'll give this soldier a burial befitting one of the bravest men our country will ever know. my first excitement, the good soldier that I was supposed to be. I did forget to load my rifle. I remember that now. So my fears as I lay there in the rubble with the gun pointed at my head were groundless. But you're wrong, Captain, about everything else. I have not been dead a week, Captain. I have been dead just a bare 18 minutes. You should have noticed that my body is still warm, and I did not die of starvation or of thirst. This brave soldier, this formidable warrior, died as much as he did from anything else. Of fear. The fear of dying. We know that the feeling of love and the feeling of hatred are very often confused. That the line that separates our feelings of love and hatred can be a very thin one. By the same token... The distinction between fear and courage can be equally narrow. When we think a person is motivated by the noblest kind of courage and bravery, it might just be possible that the driving factor is nothing more than fear, as in the case of Private Jerome Searing. An interesting footnote. Ambrose Beers, author of this story, volunteered as a private in the Indiana Infantry at the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. He served for the entire duration of the war, was twice wounded, once in the heel, and once more severely in the head. This occurred in the same battle of Kennesaw Mountain, which was the setting of our tale. I wonder if Beers' head wound could have had anything to do with Jerome Searing's difficulties. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Jennifer Harmon, Arnold Moss, and Mason Adams. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>